By the way, your friends are terrible critics. Don't ever give them stuff and expect a good, honest feedback. 90% of your friends are either going to stroke your ego or not even give it two thoughts. It comes down to voice. The voice of the character versus the voice of the author. You're just kissing ass now. You're not writing something that's going to be read or enjoyed down the line. One of the biggest failings that we have in modern media, everyone does a reboot and then they don't stick to those established rules. That's why we see so many things go awry. It must be accessible to me because I have a preconceived notion of what accessible is, and oftentimes that can really hamstring the intent of the series. to episode four of Writing Pros. I'm, of course, Shay the Red with my amazing panel. We have Mr. Eric Kennedy. How are you? Hello. I'm awake. I'm upright. I'm sitting in a chair. I'm listening along. We'll take it. We'll take it. We also have Cyborg Valkyrie. How are you doing, love? Uh, awesome. Just uh, doodling my makeup. So, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Mr. MK Gibson, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? Doing, doing good. Doing good. Uh, and of course, we have our two super stellar guests that I'm so happy we could get on. First up, we have Mr. Timothy Lim. How are you, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Have a, hope everyone is having a great day so far. Heck yeah. And we couldn't have Tim Lim without having Mr. Mark Pellegrini. How are you, sir? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. I feel I feel like you guys are like a package duo half the time. Like you get two for one, one sale. Yeah. yeah, like you, like you just you gotta you gotta have both of them. Uh, you guys do a lot of epic work with you know Common America and uh, Black Hops. Oh my gosh, Black Hops! I'm sorry, I got the stuffy of <laughs> of GI, and I just he's so cute. <laughs> he's just so fucking cute. Um, but one of the big things because you guys are you know putting out so many issues and and so consistent with both the quality and the timing and everything for all of the ips that you guys are working on uh one of the things that we really wanted to touch on was writing and editing efficiently because uh i'm in awe in all honesty with how quickly you guys have campaigns fulfill them and have the next campaign ready to go so how does how does that kind of work because i know the two of you kind of tag team uh, creating all of these IPs. So how, how do you divvy it up? Are we talking about the creative process or are we talking about kind of the pragmatic business slash scheduling side of things? Either one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The is yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. So what, it, I'll try and keep this as simple as possible. So what it boils down to is your initial game plan you have to decide on a couple of ways you do it. Do you crowdfund because you need the money to get started in which case you still have to have something done, like one, two, three to five pages, whatever it might be. Do you need the money to just finish what you've already begun? So you're already close to the finish line, but you just need to finish it off. Or in the third case, which is in my estimation, probably the most risky. What if the project is already done, but now you basically need to recoup the capital that you need to actually make it into production, which is what we're doing. So what we do is we take a lot of the risks on the front end. So we, have calculated kind of for ourselves the amount of money that we need to satisfy ourselves to make it worthwhile. Again, this is a hobby for us, for people who might not uh, know much about our background. And so we just need to know that we've made enough money to make it feasible to actually get the next thing started. Um, and so that's where that comes in, is just the scheduling and making sure that, okay, well, we're gonna get the project done first, which is time consuming. But, you know, we've had years to kind of have um, a leg ahead of in the race and get started on it. Everything else just follows from that. From the creative side of things, Mark has done several videos that actually talks about the writing process. But one of the benefits of he and I working together is we're, we're on the same page as far as what we think is funny, what we consider to be 
good lessons to be told. And the way that we enjoy prose is exactly the same. You could list a couple of authors, and he and I are pretty much in sync in terms of authors we like, authors we dislike. And a lot of it boils down to style and the way that they tell their stories. So we don't we don't have many disagreements as far as the narrative is, is concerned. Whenever we, we congeal together, it's because we, we really are thinking in sync. Douglas Ernst says that um, whenever you have a good artist writer partnership, it's like the robots in Pacific Rim, um, where you have like two people in tandem who are trying to pilot a robot simultaneously. That's kind of what we're doing. I have full control editorially over the art and he has full control editorially over the story. So okay. if there is a disagreement in the, in the writing or the general progression of the story, he can essentially overwrite me and I give him deference. On the other hand, if there's something in the art that he feels needs to be expressed differently, then I can overwrite him because that's considered my forte. So we work very symbiotically together. And you'll hear a lot of times this argument of, oh, well, who's the be who's the more important person, the writer or the artist? And we kind of think that's a really stupid concept because it's like <laughs> a comic literally doesn't exist without one or the other. That's like saying what's more important, the brain or the heart? Well, you get rid of one and you're not even like a human being. <laughs> so you have to give cre credit where credit is due. I cannot do my job without his script and he can't finish the book without my art. He can try and get someone, but some people might say it's not quite the same. You can't just take any artist and fill in that gap. I would argue, however, that not being a writer myself, I do think that the writing side is more important because I feel like with time, even with a new artist, you can actually kind of fill in that gap pretty easily and have people adapt to it. Whereas I think that getting a new writer, it just isn't the same because what it is at heart is a story. It is something that is being kind of incarnated from the mind into words, but those words are being expressed through visuals as opposed to um, an auditory means. So that's where I'm coming from, which is why I value writers. I think they're important. And I think that one lesson that was not learned from the image era was the importance of writers. I do think that that is something that if you are not a good writer yourself, you really need to learn the fundamentals of writing in order for your work to stand out. Oh, well, Tim, Tim can stay. Tim can stay now. <laughs> I was going to say, suck it, artists. <laughs> we suck we're the worst no, so that, but that's the funny thing is I think that a lot of it boils down to you know we, we talked about this a little bit last episode too we all kind of covet what we don't have so if you don't have the ability to write the way that somebody that you really respect does then of course that becomes the most important part for you and vice versa like as a writer I'm like yeah, I could tell I could tell tens of stories and uh, if I don't have a good artist behind me, it nobody's going to care. No one's because I can't, especially when you're running a campaign, the art is always forefront. The art is what leads and you can't be like, yeah, it's a really great story. Here's my 10 page script preview <laughs> for you to read to decide if i'm a good writer or not like that, yeah it's, it's it's too much of an investment in time for people to just sit there and read all your text you know i have people sometimes who dm me and, and ask if i can you know review their script and it's like it's not the same as like an artist doing a portfolio review an artist can just like look at the the drawing you made and tell you like oh tangent uh you need to work on on your perspective etc it's like a five second thing like you're at if someone asked me to read their 60 page script that's like a two hour investment you know and yeah. do all the proofreading for them and catch all their typos like oh man i can't set a aside a day for that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but so, i think oh so go on. i was i was gonna say like how so how do you kind of overcome that as a writer like what what are some of your methods to try and well, uh, so Tim and I, I mean, the, one of the reasons we work so efficiently, and we had to we had to work at it. We, we had to have a lot of trial and error when we were first starting um, as a team. Um, so the original Black Cops, Volume 1, uh, it was originally a two-issue miniseries that was published by Antarctic Press, and it was one of the earliest things that we published. And Issue 1 of Black Cops, um, uh, Tim and I, we talked about the story, what we wanted to do, and then I went directly from our conversation into writing the first draft of the script, and then I sent that to Tim, and he sent it back to me with all of his red lines and things that he wanted me to change and everything. 
And I, the second draft of the script, I had to basically completely rewrite the draft. And I, we figured out really quick that that's not efficient um, to have to completely rewrite your draft over and over again until you both have something you agree on. You know, that, that takes forever. So what we do now that's, um, that's we found has worked really well in our process is we talk about what we want to do in the next volume of Common America or Black Ops or what have you. And then I, write a, I take all of our ideas and I put them into a summary. And then I send that to Tim, and then Tim looks over the summary, and he gives me back his notes, and then I rewrite the summary, and then I do the page breakdowns, like page one, this happens, page two, this happens, page three, this happens. I send that to him, and if he has, and usually by then, because we've already agreed on the summary, um, the page breakdowns typically don't have a lot of notes, and he just sends back me like, you know, the okay symbol, like, okay. <laughs> and then I write the script, and the, yeah, I write the, the first draft, and then any notes he has in the draft is usually really negligible. So in any second draft is just um, fixing small things, and that's how we're able to pump stuff out so quickly, because it's so much easier to rewrite a summary than it is to rewrite a full draft of a comic script. And we that's figure great. that out early on, and we're just able to basically work like, like a machine and get that done. Um, and Tim, he's the artist, and like he said, um, that's his forte. So uh, whenever I send Tim a script, you know, I don't I don't consider my script to be immutably sacred because Tim has got the very arduous task of taking my words and putting them into pictures on a page. And I can visualize it in my head, but he knows what's going to look best visually on the page. So I may send him. More he cut out. <laughs> I send him the script, and he'll look at it, and um, if if I have a page that has, like, four panels, Tim, he's the artist, so he'll decide, like, oh, I could actually do this more efficiently in three panels and give, like, a bigger panel so it's more dynamic. Or he'll, like, oh, I can't do that many actions in just three panels. I'll do it in four panels. And then he'll he'll um, add an extra panel. And then, but the thing that works for us, though, is that after he does that, he'll send me the, uh, the proof after he's done all the arts, for me to adjust the dialogue, you know, if I, I wrote it for three panels, he did it in four, so maybe I need to adjust the dialogue. He'll do like a first pass at um, trying to break up the dialogue or, or change it, but I, I have final right on uh, what the, the dialogue is going to say. And that's why there's never any hard feelings between us. I mean, I know some writers are like, oh, the artist changed everything and I'm so pissed. and Or like an artist who's just like so pissed at his writer, like, oh, the writer, you know, he, he takes so much credit when I have to, uh, you know, take all of, all of his words and put them on the page and they hate each other. Whereas Tim and I, well, it's, it's such a back and forth process that's, um, you know, <laughs> it, we, we, don't, we don't care. <laughs> Listen, I don't want to start up any conspiracy theories or anything, but I genuinely believe you are the same person. Thank you. I was thinking the same thing. Like I, I, I genuinely I, I, believe the both of you. As soon as as soon as more cut out, I was like, oh, Tim pressed the wrong button. He was about to go into his Tim voice. Yeah, <laughs> right? Throwing his voice. Or we're, we're like Tom X and Zaymot. You, you punch him, and I feel it too. Which, one, which one of you has the cool scar on the face? That's, that's me. me. I call I call it scar. Nah, I'll take a knife right now and, and carve it into my face. Like that. <laughs> I, I've never seen the both of you in the same room. To be fair, I've never seen the both of you in person. But I'm, I, that's still, I'm not. Turn on your cameras, you cowards. Oh. We're not photo. We're not photogenic like <laughs> so like sucked. Eric Panetti is. <laughs> I'm, I'm Pug Fugly and I'm on here, so. Oh, that was perfect timing, Sai. I appreciate that. You're muted, sweetie. I, I felt threatened. I had to do it. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. So I, I like how you guys talk about doing like a big perspective and narrowing down because that's kind of that's kind of the approach that I took when I, you know, got to write like a, a mini story for Adam Lawson. And I was like, here's an idea. And he's like, cool, write it. And I was like, oh. <laughs> okay and so then i wrote a little more and i was like here's an idea and he was like cool but write it and i was like oh, okay like still not got you and then i was like so you said you said i could have like seven pages right and he's like yeah and i was like cool so i wrote eight uh sorry it has to be eight i tried really hard and it's eight and uh here's my 15 page script to show you those eight pages I was yeah. like, here's pictures, references, and everything. Did I write it yet? <laughs> like, but you're you're right. Can I dig in? Going big to small. I was gonna say, can I dig in a little bit more into your guys' this, um, for lack of a better term, like planning? Are are you guys that far ahead into sort of 
where you're taking this series? Do you guys, or, or, or to, to Shay's point at the beginning part of this conversation, is it being impacted or, um, uh, yeah, is it being impacted by the kind of feedback that you get after each book goes out into the wild? Yes and no. That's actually a great question because that's something we've had, we haven't had to deal with up until probably a month and a half ago. So to mm. answer the first question, we know how the series ends. So we have planned it so far ahead that we can easily get 20 plus volumes out of it. So this is a long-term plan that we have. It is Did you say 20? Yes, at least 20. I got to go. So we I have go to because it's <laughs> I want to work on this until I retire. Well, I don't even think I'm going to retire. I think I'm just going to drop dead just working at it. But the idea is that I, that took a turn. <laughs> we <laughs> we know exactly where it ends. We have a very definitive conclusion. Uh, we so know cool. we know it down to the last page how it looks like. But we can take our sweet time getting there because there's a lot of filler material that we have to tell. That being mm. said, um, do we change based on feedback? Originally, no, because most of the feedback mm. that we've been getting has been positive. But we're running into a hurdle as it is with any story that has kind of a bigger scope, which is the mm. idea of bloat because your world becomes bigger. And as the world becomes bigger, the plot lines become more intricate. So something, and this is actually, I think, an exclusive that we haven't told anyone, but we'll tell it here on the stream, was we, I listened to all the reviews. I don't care mm -hmm. how negative they are. I don't care how positive we are, they are. We don't take mm -hmm. anything personally because this is just a hobby for us. Like, I know sure. some people, sure. it's their bread and butter, so they really take it, like, quote, unquote, seriously. Like, they get really offended by um, criticism. But to us, it's like, nah, if you tell me my art sucks, tell me why, and I'll see if I can fix it. I don't make any promises. If there's something wrong in the plot that we didn't address, like we want to know that too. But mm. almost unanimously from volume five, what people were saying was they were saying like, well, most people liked it, but there were a lot of people who said like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. Like there's like three plot mm. threads going on. What's happening here? Yeah. So yeah. I sat down with Mark and I was already about 10 pages into volume uh, six. And right now, as of this recording, I'm only about 14 pages away from being done. So about 10 pages in, I said, we have to stop the press right now. Like, I am not pr proceeding forward. We have to rewrite the whole script. And mm. so we talked about it, and I said, well, you and I, we have a myopic point of view, as all creators do, because you like your own work. In yeah. your head, it makes sense, but yeah. you're not trying to yeah. convince yourself. You're trying to tell the story to other people. And people right. are saying, this is too bloated. And so I looked mm. at the script and I said, Mark, I know you're going to hate it because you've written this whole thing and you and I both agreed on it. So I'm taking some fault here too. But there is a way to streamline this where we can cut out 60% of the fat and leave the good stuff. And so yeah. we, and, we, and we halted the... all production for two weeks and Mark well, got al back. Almost. Yeah. You were still drawing. So we agreed that the first act was, was fine and you were still drawing that. And you're like, Mark, you need to rewrite the second act completely. So we're, it was almost like laying the, the track <laughs> as the train is coming. You're like, oh, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> and, and putting that down. And yeah. I, but it was, it was an improvement. And that's the thing, too, is I know I just said that we always agree on, on the scripts. So the draft doesn't go through a lot of changes. But in the case of um, the, the upcoming Common America Volume 6, which is going to come out um, this winter, uh, that was a case where we were like, we could really make this better. And we do have a legitimate issue with uh, the second act. And rather than commit to, to drawing and finalizing something we're not sure about, why don't we perfect it? Even if it is a lot more work, and even if it is, like I said, you know, like I'm, Tim's drawing the first act, Mark, you gotta rewrite the second act before I get there, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> and yeah. and I ended up with a script that I was even more satisfied with. I'm like, this is much better. Um, a lot of the things that, that people have uh, people have read Volume Five of Common America and they like it, but like Tim said, um, the when we listened to the criticism, the one uniform criticism was like, there's it's front loaded with too much plot. Like there's mm. there's too much, it, not necessarily exposition, but it's setting up a lot of stuff. And everyone yes. and the reviews are like, like it's setting up a lot, but the characters are kind of getting lost in the narrative setup. So with volume yeah. two, um, and that's something like when you have a big picture in your head, you almost lose track of that. Like, oh, yeah, because we also have Common America, the web series that updates every Wednesday on Webtoon. And that's where we mm -hmm. do a lot of the, the little slice of life stuff of the characters just kind of like having fun together. 
And in my head, you know, I separate the webtoon, or I, I combine the, rather the webtoon and the mm -hmm. main series, and I kind of forget that they're separate entities. And mm -hmm. like, there's a slice of life stuff going on in the webtoon, but maybe it's being neglected in the main volume. But what about the people who only read the main volume? They need the slice of life stuff in there too. Um, they mm -hmm. they need um, that time to slow down and give the characters an opportunity to you know interact and develop their dynamics and even though that's going on over in the webtoon you need to have it in the, the main series as well um and that's yeah, one of those things where you like, lose track yeah <laughs> yeah this sounds like in part just sort of a the a situation that you guys put yourselves in due to the the nature of the success of the series right so i mean it's it's good in such a way that people have become so invested in your characters and the stories that you're telling because they want to keep coming back. And now you're getting sort of that really actionable feedback, like we want to keep coming back. But as we do, we are running into a situation where like this might have been the first one that I picked up because it's um, the thing that my, my buddy recommended to me. And it wasn't necessarily in a, you know, it wasn't necessarily recommended chronologically. Right. So I think that's it's a really smart sort of space to be in to realize, yeah, there is that quote unquote bloat, but also you guys had the, the audacity to pivot, I think in the most critical way. Yeah. And the best what part about that? it was that yeah. we didn't, uh, this is the most important part. We did not sacrifice the story. So mm. the plot has remained unchanged, but all the things happening in that plot have been streamlined. So it's not six things happening at once it's two things happening at once so we were able to actually mm. boil it down to just an a plot a plot and a b plot um yeah. and it, so it runs a lot smoother and i compared both scripts together and i said the second script after the audience feedback is a lot better it is objectively cleaner it is easier to follow um if you enjoy kind of the nuances that we put in it that has not been lost that's still there but mm -hmm. if you're a, just kind of a casual reader and you do want it to be quote unquote simplified. It is a much more simpler plot and it's a lot more enjoyable, we think. Um, one That's thing that cool. I encourage Mark to do was there's that, it's a manga series and it's an anime as well called Bakuman. And it's about two teenage boys and their dream is to be manga artists. And it's actually written by a guy who works for Shonen Jump. And in a fictionalized way, they go through the process of making manga. And one of the things that they do that I thought was very striking was they have one editor, it's their second editor, who's bad. And it's kind of a lesson in terms of this is the nightmare that can happen if you have a bad editor. And he said, well, your sales are falling. Here's what you need to do. Here's all this fan mail. You need to do what the fans tell you to do. And it doesn't help. It actually makes it worse. But mm. their editor, they get another editor back. And he says, well, don't get me wrong. You should listen to your... Uh, your readership, but there's a way of being able to kind of cherry pick the good stuff out of it instead of just adhering to what they say. Otherwise, you come up with something completely predictable. For example, mm -hmm. so the majority of our people who have read our work and are familiar with it, they all had that universal criticism. They said, you know, I enjoy it nine out of 10. The only thing is that it is bloated. Like, I really hope that this is just the front end and not the whole series going forward because it is way too hard to keep track of what's going on. But we had like another critic who came in, another person who has read our work, and he was saying things like, well, I'm disappointed because she's making money off of being a superhero. I'm disappointed because she has a sure. public identity, and that's not how superheroes sure. work. Their, their identity sure. should be private. Um, I'm disappointed that in this book, she, she, she never does anything heroic. It's all something that's part of a spectacle or part of like an intimate um, plot or something like that. And I just said, you know, Mark and I talked about it, and I said, that's objectively, one, wrong. Because if you look at the body of work, I mean, this is something that's been consistent since volume mm -hmm. one. And mm -hmm. two, it's not. it might not be in the context of what you imagine the superhero yes. genre to be, but mm -hmm. that's not to say it hasn't been done. I mean, Captain America has a public identity. So mm. being able to compare it to other pre-existing works and use it as criticism, the re reality is that there are times when your readership, your customer, they are not right. They are actually objectively wrong. And we have to be the ones who have to sit there and kind of have a clear mind and think to ourselves, what is the clear criticism that we can change? And what is mm. the criticism that we have to ignore because it's not going to help us in any way moving forward? See, yeah. right, Just look at Booster Gold. Talk about not profiting from, uh, <laughs> from his adventures. Yeah. Mm. Well, and that, I mean, that's a, that's an important thing that I think a lot of, especially younger writers, 
need to to kind of embrace where it's like every and I've said this before I think this was actually my quote in the episode one but every bit of criticism that you receive isn't something that you have to change yeah. about your story it, there's there are people who don't follow things maybe well or you know I, there's been times where I've read something and reading it when I'm half awake I was like this doesn't make any damn sense. Like this is a clear, <laughs> you know, diversion from what it was supposed to be. And then like, I go back and read it when I'm actually, you know, mentally there. And I'm like, Oh, I'm just an idiot. It actually makes perfect <laughs> sense. And I just wasn't picking up on all the little, Yeah, bits. there's constructive criticism and then there's trolling and you just need to <laughs> learn to separate the two and, and understand like not everybody who's giving you, legitimate feedback is some jerk trolling you on the internet like they actually read and they digested your work and they thought about it and this was was uh the feedback that they have for you and there's another person just like yeah this sucks man go kill yourself you know like that's a troll like right. there's a difference between them <laughs> oh i've had those it, it's, it's like the serenity prayer knowing that uh, give me the uh, know the difference give, let me help me change what i can and like know the difference of what i can't change that yeah, whole, yeah exactly that, whole, that thing I, I've actually got like the worst feedback I get is when my, whenever my books are on sale, if it's like, if it's, if they're on sale for like, you know, let's see, or for free on Kindle Unlimited or something like that, the ones who read for free or pick it up on like for a 99 cent sale, those are the feedbacks I get that are exceptionally cruel, but then there's people who pay for it, normal price and they're like, oh no, there's some mistakes, but I still like the story. There's almost like a price point to <laughs> content <laughs> mental. Well, it is, it's. It, it, uh, people who spend their money on an, like an audiobook credit or buy it on audiobook or a credit tend to get are much nicer than the people who get it for free. Also, yeah. also this is like, great for twelve ninety nine. <laughs> it, it well, it kind of is. There well, are people. There's there's that false that you ascribe value to something because you paid for it. There's also the fact that if you're gonna if you're gonna pay for it, like this this happens to me all the time, where I'll end up with just a stack of like Kindle credits that I'm like, oh shit i got 13 of them and you know four of them are about to expire i i don't pay super close attention to the stuff that i'm getting because i'm like i've already i've already paid for it and i'm about to lose out on my money so if i lose out on my money because i don't use it or i lose out on my money because i get something that sucks it's just it's kind of a wash so i'll i'll take a lot more risks but when i'm down to like one or two credits and you know or i'm gonna buy something specifically I pay very close attention to the abstracts and what the stories are about. And like, oh, you know, reading this, pretty sure this is something I'm not going to like. Maybe I don't buy it there. And then, you know, so there's there's a lot more care that goes into the selection process, I think, when you're when you're paying for it at a somewhat decent price point or something that you deem is valuable. And that's that yeah. helps with the feedback a lot. Yeah, yeah I go, watch, taking uh, a step back. Go oh, on, sorry. Go on, Eric, sorry. I was going to say that going back to your to I think the the theme of the conversation or at least the the theme of your guys' reply in understanding your intent ver and and sort of like taking internalizing the feedback and executing it executing on it in a certain way um because it helps to stand up that intent oh we couldn't see it because we had a blind spot for it in regards to like having it be bloat and then there's the other one where it's just like i don't like the way that girl is posed or i don't like their character motivations in which like and so the you know that that falls right into the subjective line i i recall just recently how much flack a game like elden ring got and the biggest i think the 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 all across the board feedback that er, that they got was oh this i can't play this game because it's too hard <laughs> and i thought like get fucking good yeah. or you know there are plenty <laughs> plenty of games out there who are that's clearly more catered to you so it, there there's this sort of i guess environment now or climate now where it's like it must be accessible to me because i have a preconceived notion of what accessible is and oftentimes that can really hamstring um, the intent of the series, the themes of the series. So it's it's refreshing to know that you guys are able to sort of parse all of that and say, yeah, that's not usable. That's not really actionable for us because uh, to your point, um, Mark, you're, you're laying down the track as Tim is coming, but at the very least, you have a destination for that track, right? Yeah, we. Um, so one of the other things too is that we see a lot of people online now that we've gotten five volumes out of Common America plus all the tie-in stuff with Black Ops, etc., we see a lot of folks online who read our books and they they have conversations where they're speculating where it's going to go. And we see those. Now, we don't 
we don't hit like and we don't hit reply <laughs> because we don't want anybody to think that, you know, like, oh, we're nudging them along or we're, we're agreeing with their speculation, etc. We want stuff to be a surprise, but we do read those. And we know that sometimes when we do get cri uh, critical feedback, uh, it's because a person is speculating. You know, they're like, oh, this character is going to, like, if it's a romantic subplot, like, this character is going to end up with this character. Or, and they've already kind of, like, made up their decision in their head when that hasn't happened yet. And, like, Tim and I can be like, well, that's wrong, but we're not going to say anything because we, we don't want um, to ruin our own storyline. So sometimes we do get, and I've, I've been guilty of that, too. I used to review Ninja Turtle comics back in the day, and, you know, I'd be reading them as they came out, and I had my speculation of where such and such was going to go, and that would that would color my criticism of the current issue. Um, yep. And you kind of have to catch yourself when you're doing that as a reader, and you also, as a creator, you kind of just have to, you know, like, bite your tongue and hold off and say, like, well, they're going to see how it turns out. Well, and I, I think it's a difference between understanding. And sometimes, when, you know, biting your tongue can be the hardest part. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think, it's a, I think it's a huge difference between understanding when criticism is like a legitimate place where you're like, okay, this is a place where maybe we had a stumbling block and we can we can catch that next time versus um, you, you're unhappy with a certain aspect of the story that you are supposed to be unhappy with. Yeah. And I'm not changing it because it's important for you to feel that like discontent for what's going to happen later so that it's good. I know that you're unhappy yeah. and I know right now you don't want to be unhappy. You want to <laughs> be happy, but guess what? You're just, yeah. you're going to be unhappy until the next issue. And then it resolves at some point or whatever. Like a lot of the stuff that I like to write is not happy stuff. Like I've had my friends read it. Uh, which, by the way, your friends, your friends are terrible critics. Don't ever get them stuff <laughs> and expect a good, honest feedback. Because 90% of your friends are either going to stroke your ego or not even give it, like, two thoughts. Um, but I've, I've given stuff to friends to read and had them read it. And there's no comment on the writing or if it was good. The comment that I get is, are you okay? And I'm like, <laughs> yes. I, like... Obviously, it made you feel something because you had to ask me this dumbass question. So, like, yes, I'm fine. And what did you think of the writing? They go, I'm just really worried about you. And I'm like, I'm going to take this as a good because it made you feel uncomfortable. And that's what I was going for. And we're going to stop having this conversation because I feel like you're about to try to psychoanalyze me. And really, I don't need you in my life like that. There was Can, that, I, follow that up? Can I follow up on that? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if this is going to land well between the both of you. How do you write Common America so fucking wholesome? It is the story-wise, character-wise, um, like plot-wise, it is so approachable that it makes me sick. Not, not in a bad way. It makes me sick because... Good it, sick. Like, I never, th like, oh my gosh, that's, that is so impactful in its whole wholesomeness. And it just broadens the audience that you are able to sort of like bring into it. Because I write trash, right? Like I write <laughs> giant crab monsters spewing their crab goo all over my protagonist, right? But when I read Common America, there's, there's again, the, the wholesomeness of it all just makes me go like, these guys have something going on. That they, they are just, they know their audience. They understand the potential of where they can go. Does well, that make, does we that kind of put too, ourselves in a well, box. Part of it is two, well, part of it is twofold. Yeah. One of it is there's a, there's a degree of bait and switch that's a joke. And it's done intentionally. Um, I think when Mark and I were first conceiving of it, because we didn't want to do like a female protagonist. I mean, we've never done it before. We honestly kind of did it almost as a dare. But it reminded me of this... I guess joke or a concept or a skit I had heard, which is like, what if there was a convent somewhere and they put up a neon sign that just said like free lap dances. And so like <laughs> guy, guys would go there thinking they'd get a free lap dance, but the nuns would just try to convert them. And I just thought that was such a funny visual image. Cause I just thought, I think that's like a moral gray line because in a way you're kind of lying to them. But the idea is that it's like the means justifies the ends because one thing we did with common America, we, intentionally design her to look the way that she did because it was a red herring we wanted people to kind of look at it and say whoa like this is this looks like a really fun character <laughs> and maybe she's gonna be naked in the book and then they read it and they're like oh man like i feel like comfy because that was like such a fun read like at the end of it 
Um, and I tell this story all the time. The number one request I would get on that first Kickstarter was people. I mean, I had to have had at least 30 DMs and it was like, Hey, any chance of a nude variant, any chance of a nude variant? I was like, I didn't want to say no, because once you read it, you'll see that's not in line with the character, but I would just say not at the moment. And you know, that's, that's a fairly truthful response. You're such a businessman, Tim. I love it. We never, not not at this moment or any future moment, right? You know, just leave that last bit off. The last part was silent. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) We never got that we never got the question again, at least not in the volume that we did in the beginning. And I told Mark, this is good because it meant that they read it and they said, the character's too wholesome. We cannot in good conscience request that because it would be antithetical to her. And in fact, whenever people on Twitter do like pornography art of her, we never like it. We never retweet it because we're like, that's completely antithetical to the character. In fact, you you have clearly demonstrated you don't understand the character. So we we're not obligated to share it. Even if that was something that we would want to share, we would not do it because you don't understand it. Um, But going back to this idea of the wholesomeness, part of the impetus of writing it was that we had grown, uh, I had particularly grown jaded with a lot of modern comics. And so as I was looking more into manga and anime, I noticed just by coincidence, I was watching a lot of anime that had female casts, like all female protagonists. Mm. And I noticed that all the ones I had watched, I was like, Dad gum, like this is really comfy, like really wholesome. Nothing to it as far as um, politics, no hidden agenda, nothing like that. It was specifically my, it was little, it was Little Witch Acad- Academia on Netflix. I had watched it and I said, this is probably the best show I've seen in the last five years. And I said to Mark, I said, I know you don't like anime, but you need to watch this show. And so he watched it and he said the same thing. He said, my gosh, like that's so crazy that that show had an all girl cast and you would think that would be a ripe environment to shoehorn something, but they don't, they just kind of just tell a story Mm. and they use, they use the natural femininity and cuteness of characters to aid in the storytelling to the point where you can't just swap them out with boys and have exactly the same story. It would be something completely different. So we intentionally do that in our, in our book, we have a, a handful of hard rules one of them is there's no there's no nudity, no sex, no swearing, no drug use. There's some alcohol use, but it's only done for a comedic effect, not as a form of propagation. But we just stick to it, and that keeps it the way it is. There are things that we could insinuate. So, for example, it's like, well, which of the characters have been in a quote-unquote relationship? And it's like, well, that's something that Mark and I know, but we're not going to tell you because that's superfluous mm-hmm. information. That does not well, do, we, That doesn't mean we, anything. We put ourselves in a box intentionally in yeah. certain ways because we, we write basically for a PG rating. We want yeah. kids to be able to read the comic, you know, like the comics we read. Like I would read X-Men back in the, the 90s and Psylocke is running around in a bathing suit, essentially jump kicking uh, Magneto. Uh, but it was still a PG book. You know, there's nothing, you know, inappropriate about it. But we, we do it on purpose because one, we want kids to be able to read it. Um, but also... It, it helps us maintain a consistent tone and um, mm-hmm. a consistent atmosphere of the book. And I know a lot of writers, a lot of creators, their attitude is like, no, I'm not going to put myself in a box. I'm just going to do whatever I want whenever I want to. And they're, the output that they create ends up just being a mess uh, because there's no consistency. You know, one moment it's something that looks like it's for little kids and the next moment it's something that looks like it's X-rated. You know, it can't sure. decide what it wants to be. Like I think of um, like Thundercats, you know, the, the Saturday morning cartoon in the 80s, very much written for kids, but had great stories, great characters, very popular. Everybody loved it. Then in the 2000s, Wildstorm decided they were going to do a follow, like a sequel. You know, like, this is the season five of Thundercats you never got in comic book form. And but it's for adults. So all mm-hmm. of a sudden, like Lino is, is chopping people's heads off and there's gore up getting her clothes torn off and like Mumbra is doing really nasty things to people and they're swearing up a storm and I'm like this is awful yeah you you <laughs> you know you took the the reins off of it you took it outside of its box as a kids show and now you have complete freedom to do whatever you want and it's terrible it was better yeah. when it was on Saturday mornings and you had to write for a, a G or PG level audience so you have to give yourself a consistent a rule guide as a, a rule book you know like these are what i can do this is what i can't do it's part of your um your world bit, building part of your style guide whenever you're creating your characters and your your comic and your concept um mm. you can break those rules or you can bend them for emphasis rarely 
You know, like if it's a really, really important moment, then maybe you can have a character say, damn, you know, and that's like, oh, you know, it's like in, in Transformers, the movie, you yeah, know, when Spike says it. like, oh, reference. shit, yeah. it's like, oh, shit, what are we going to do now? And like all the kids like, like go nuts. Like, oh, my God, he just swore. <laughs> uh, but like, he only does that it, once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that's why it had impact. If, if uh, the Transformers were swearing all the time, you wouldn't care. But the one mm -hmm. time a character does it, it's a big deal. Um, and that's why having your your set rules before you when you're creating your book is is so vital so that when you do break them it feels like a big deal so and I you think had that pg-13 and i'm sorry go ahead Sam. that's all right i, I was just going to add I, I think that's one of the the most uh the one of the biggest failings that we have in modern media uh whether it's uh tv or movies or whatever everyone does a reboot and then they don't stick to those established rules mm to that Bible that, that you had of, of an established canon. And I think that that's how we, that's why we see so many things go awry. Like, uh, I don't know, Star Trek discovery or Picard or it. I, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. And I see these, these things just trampling over the rules that, that were set, you know, for decades. Well, and this, and, this goes back to, they're not fans. The people that are right. doing these aren't fans. They're, they're consumers. The yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they're, they're creating stuff that isn't, it's not rooted in that world because they're not rooted in that world mm -hmm. in any capacity. So they don't, they don't even know that there are rules that exist. Well, like, there's this such, don't... yeah, there's this weird attitude and it's so different between America, like American adaptations versus of American media versus Japanese adaptations of Japanese media. I'm watching the spy family anime right now, and it is a one-to-one -one translation of the manga. Like they, the people who are making the anime read the manga and understood it, enjoyed it, and like, okay, we're going to adapt this as accurately as possible mm -hmm. into the animated medium. They add little flourishes here and there, you know, where they can expand upon the action and take advantage of the fact that they have animation and movement, but they are making no fundamental changes to the content. Um, and it doesn't, and I, I doubt that everybody making the anime is a fan of Spy Family, the manga, or even cares. They just have this understanding that they need right. to be reverent to the source material when they adapt respect. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. respect. Which is the opposite of any adaptation we do in the U.S. We take a comic or we take a novel, and the first thing we we say is like, how can we fix it? How can we improve it? What's wrong with it? You know, how can we we mm. put our own personal spin on it? And that's how you end up with like Roland Emmerich's Godzilla from like 1998, where he's like, oh, Godzilla is so stupid. This giant walking like Tyrannosaurus, like it's it's dumb. We need to make it more like Jurassic Park. And then you end up with this Godzilla movie that everybody hates because the person making it didn't understand and didn't care about the source material versus like the Godzilla movies we've been getting recently with the MonsterVerse, which, you know, do love Godzilla and do take uh, very, very accurate means to portray him like, like he's supposed to be. But it's, it's just this attitude where if you're going into your adaptation with contempt for the source material, you're going to create a bad adaptation. Whereas if you go into it and you, you want to pay as much respect to it as possible then yeah you're gonna have a great adaptation it's well that's so like simple. that you mentioned uh, the anime earlier with the with the, fe the all females and, and piggybacking on like the love and respect it's like because when i was watching a, was arcane on netflix it blew me away with like they took the league of legends characters and expounded on it and that that show was hauntingly beautiful both in storytelling and visuals if you haven't watched Arcane, I, I can't say enough good things about it. Okay. I mean, do I need to have played the games to enjoy Not the show? even a little. Okay, cool. Not even a little. Like, to the people, because, I mean, it's a MOBA, so people that know of these characters, these champion type of people, but, like, the story expounds on it. At the heart of it, it's just two sisters who grew up very poor and due to this, like, this weird steampunky world, but their lives are, never, are, are bound together and pulled apart by conflicts that happen within the world. And it is haunting and how good it is. And it, the, the music, the style, the art, the animation, and the storytelling. So Cool. I, I kind of I... worked on that show. So <gasps> <it does. laughs> I was going to say, I, I feel like there's... I think that that's where a lot of people get it wrong is when they're, when they're thinking an adaptation and it's off of something that had like, hey, have you played the games? Have you? <laughs> <Not at> <laughs> Oh, sigh, you're horrible. Mm, we'll, we'll drop it in the chat during the premiere of this episode. Yep. Don't worry. Yep, it'll happen. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> you know, when, when you have people that are, are trying to adapt something that maybe came from video games or came from, like, this other source of media and they're trying to bring it to the general population, 
they get confused with making it accessible for people, even if they haven't played the games, to fixing everything about it. And it's like that those are different things. What you're doing, what your job is at that point is to find a way to still tell those stories and cover relevant parts that happened in the other form of media within this new, you know, bundle of whatever it is you're creating. But it isn't for you to decide this was messed up. So let's fix it all here. <laughs> like that's not, that's not what you're doing. There's still the rules. You're just kind of condensing down the important parts to bring it to a new audience. I was going to follow up with something that uh, Mark, do you guys believe that that's cultural? Do you think that comes from a cultural place? That yeah, but that's a like... big, that's a big topic. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have, I have just... very unpopular views when it comes to that, but yeah, yeah. I do. I do think it is cultural. Yeah. I, think I think a lot that's... of it, a lot of it has to deal with subversion, um, at, f- subversion as opposed to fidelity. I think is a big one too. And I think mm-hmm. don't go be wrong. I think that t- the temptation is always there. Mm-hmm. Um, don't get me wrong. There there are times when in our script I thought, whoa, wouldn't it be neat if we actually put this? It's, it, it'd be a reference to this real world event, and mm-hmm. we just have to rein ourselves in because it's like no. We want it so that 20 years from now, people will be able to read it kind of in a vacuum and enjoy it for what it is, where thematically, the thing that they're struggling against is just kind of an overall theme for whatever um, rears its ugly head in history as opposed to something in isolation. So I think that what happens is culturally, there are a lot of people in the creative sphere who get kind of power hungry because they feel like they've been given carte blanche to um, shoehorn their own. Um, ideologies and whatnot into it and some of that does bleed over Um, a lot of times a work is going to have some reflections of the author or authors in it but I do think that there are ways where you can conceal it where you're not quite sure the the rule of thumb that was given by a mutual friend of ours he used to tell us um, you know the hallmark of a good author because you read a book or you read a work of their fiction and you leave knowing more about the characters you know a really bad writer when you read the same work and you leave knowing nothing except about the writer. And I think that in a lot of modern fiction that comes out of America, that's 100% the case where Mm. you're reading something and it's okay storytelling wise, but you reach this point and you're like, that is not the character talking. That is the the talking Mm. head of the writer that's actually Mm. happening there. Um, They stripped the veneer off of whatever the source material was before uh, they got their hands on it, and they used that as the ideological vehicle to drive home whatever whatever crusade the the writer is on. And and I'll give you a very good example that, that speaking of crusade, that um, highlights this. We were talking about kind of favorite moments in movies where, for some reason, there's a fluidity fluidity to the storytelling where you'd be you'd have to kind of second guess what the the author was um trying to come up with because it's done so well that it seems like it's the character so there's a scene in indiana jones and the last crusade where harrison ford and sean connery who plays his dad they just escaped um grunewald castle and they take a break and um they're having kind of this dialogue with each other and indiana jones tells his dad he's like i can't believe it because you got kidnapped you got honey trapped and then now they've left with the map to the grail and now we're screwed and he takes the lord's name in vain and sean connery slaps him in the face and he looks at him and it's a serious moment and sean connery says that's for blasphemy and he says the grail is not just an artifact like it means something and the funny thing is this that movie was directed by a Jewish person. So it's not a testament of faith. It has nothing to do with the faith of the author. It has to do with the person directing the movie saying, no, Sean Connery plays a religious man who just happens to be a Christian. He takes his faith seriously that he does not want his son blaspheming. And that is the powerful moment in the movie. And so that's like a point where you're not thinking like, yeah, I hate it how he shoehorned his faith into this movie. There's not any cogent... um, person who's seen that movie who escaped thinking that that's what steven spielberg wanted to do it just made sense because it's a movie where they're trying to retrieve a religious artifact Mm -hmm. there's a good chance that there's going to be a religiosity to one of the primary characters in the same sense in our work we have um like uh, kimiko common ramen she's not 
Christian. She's not Catholic. She's Shinto. And I don't even know if we're ever going to address her religion in the book because it doesn't matter. The character in our head exists completely separate from us. Um, and mm. so we want to make sure that when we write her, that we write her in character and not put anything into her that is coming from either my religious um, viewpoint or Mark's. That's great. I think it goes back to ego. That, that lack of respect, that the, that the people dealing with whatever property just have such an overinflated sense of their own ego that they, they inject these things or, or twist the story or, or whatever. There's, there's that bleed through because they feel that, that their beliefs have to be more righteous than whatever they could write for the character. Yeah, it's everybody wants to make it like... If, You kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> bot. whatever. Signature you, on it. You cut, cut out. out. Okay, so. I just heard me talk about Tom <laughs> Jones. Yeah, that that's a bad timing. Um, no, but the idea is that everybody wants to put in Hollywood anyway. Is they they don't want you to just see Sonic the Hedgehog. They want you to see Paramount presents Sonic the Hedgehog. So they make this nightmare mm. monster version of Sonic so that is distinct. It doesn't look like the video game version. Like you know when you see this that this is the mm. Paramount version, and everybody hated it. And then they, they hired an artist My from the, the Sonic the Hedgehog comic book, Tyson Hess, to redesign well, their redid. horrible nightmare CG yeah. creation to look like <laughs> the game they, version, and everybody loved their it. Their first one was disturbing. Nightmare yeah. Yeah. The first one was horrific. It's, it's and I love I love that they at least so my, cared My enough. son, who was just here... He just said, like, when he was in here earlier, he loved that first movie, but he saw that original concept. And he goes, Dad, was this a new Coke thing where they did it on purpose to make it bad to get attention? So they brought the real, the good looking one in so everyone would go watch it. And he's 10. And I'm like, you know what, son? You might have hit the nail on that, the head. A lot of people I'm... were were thinking that, you know, and that's the weird thing, too, is that I want, I'm so cynical that I would believe that. It's just right. that. They also produced so much merchandise and shipped it out to stores that they had to recall. And like the amount of money wasted on doing that just yeah. doesn't – it doesn't seem like that's something they would do as like a psyop, you know, for their product. But on the other hand, you know, it, it also seems – it's so in line with, with marketing these days. But I look at Paramount, right? Paramount also did – those awful Michael Bay Transformers movies where the Transformers are hideously oh. ugly. And they did those awful Michael Bay Ninja Turtles movers, movies where the Turtles are hideously ugly. Having a Sonic the Hedgehog movie by Paramount where Sonic is hideously ugly, it's on brand for Paramount. But this was just the, the final straw that, that made them like, all right, we need to uh, stop this nonsense. Well, the... But we're talking about adaptations. And those Sonic movies, I've watched them both, both in theaters. I've enjoyed them quite a bit. Well, and they're really both, good. Yeah. Yeah, they, they're they're very respectful to the games, the stories within the games, even including like really obscure stuff like the anime and the yep. cartoons, the deep cartoons and the the comics, and they take Sonic out of those those video games that source material. They put him in a live action setting, you know, and they have to compromise like, oh, we have to put him, you know, in like San Francisco, and we have to have a, a celebrity actor with him, et cetera, et cetera. But they do it through the filter of authenticity to the source material. And so those movies are popular. If Kids I may, love them. Adults love them. Everybody loves them because they, they do them so well. It's like, why I can't may, all adaptations be like that? You're, you're kind of like, it's touching on that. And what you're saying earlier, it comes down to voice, you know, the voice of the character versus, versus the voice of, of the author mm -hmm. or the, or the writer in that case. Cause I know plenty of, I, cause I'm, I'm, I don't, I work in indie uh, novels as opposed to the comics, but I know a lot of indie novelists and I read their books and blah, blah, blah. And I can clearly see you are writing this. This is you, your voice mm -hmm. as your character and you're, writing this stuff politics left right or in the middle regardless you just want to be heard by your demographic at the now you don't care about what the character feels and it's very clear that you are just echo chambering your politics left right or center doesn't matter so badly that you, it's kind of like right it's kind of like what those uh, those really those movies that were good at the moment um uh, take uh, the, the naked gun but or uh, uh later on like the scary movies like it's just hitting on pop culture now the movies don't stand at the test of time because the pop culture moves on so rapidly mm -hmm. You're just kissing ass now. You're not writing something that's going to be read or enjoyed down the line. You just want instant gratification from your respective echo chamber. And take, but when you bring up something like Sonic, they there was a wholesomeness to it. They took this character, they put it into this world and, with love, and they had to modernize a few things, but they stayed true to the spirit of that character. 
and it's shown through. And that's why they were actually fun adventures that were enjoyed by, you know, a, a mid forties person and my 10 year old son. So, <laughs> yeah. And so a trick that, that I use uh, when I'm writing characters, you know, when I, when I write their dialogue and I read it in my head, I don't read it in my own voice. I assign a voice actor to every character I create and I read it in my head in their voice. And I think like, does this sound like something that character would say? It doesn't sound right coming from that character's voice. And then I rewrite it. So we have this, this character that's in both Black Ops and Common America named Dr. Gracie. And he's designed to look like Vincent Price. Um, but his voice in my head is specifically Maurice LaMarche's Orson Welles impression <laughs> nice. that he used on like the critic and like the brain from Pinky and the Brain. And so that's the voice I hear in my head whenever I write his dialogue. And then I, re I read it back to myself in my head with Maurice LaMarche's Orson Welles impression. And if it doesn't sound right coming from that voice, then I rewrite it. And that I think goes a long way in preventing I, you I from do even subconsciously doing it. Very similar thing with my, yeah. with my, uh, my, uh, my, one of my go-to audiobook narrators. I write for his voice, and if I can't hear him saying this, I'll I'll change it because I I make more money in my my audiobooks than I do with my, my paperbacks and ebooks. But if I can't hear him saying it this way, then I have to rewrite it. You know, let alone the authenticity of the respective character. But I. I same same sort of self uh, self editorializing. So. Yeah, and if people are wondering yeah. which characters are which, so uh, <laughs> a lot of people uh, have asked us who have heard that kind of advice in our book. Si one that we can tell you for sure, Siggy, the man, he's Lorenzo Music. So every time he talks, he has to sound like Garfield or Peter Venkman from the real <laughs> Ghostbusters. And um, that yeah. just came up because yesterday Mark and I had a That's business a meeting, and uh, we were actually having this talk with one of the. Uh, with one of the studios who's working on the manga, um, they're having a little bit of a hard time kind of nailing his character. And we were basically like, so this is who we patterned his mannerisms after. This is who you should, in your head, when you read our dialogue, you should be hearing this guy with that kind of prosaic type delivery to his uh, his pattern. But that's a, I think that's a very hand, handy piece of advice that Mark gives to all writers is, you know, you watch enough cartoons or you know enough actors. I mean, heck, let's say you don't watch cartoons take a celebrity actor you know with a good voice and you know have assign them to that character it's kind of like um when i read eric Kennedy's arc athena i assign gilbert godfrey to um diviana you know <laughs> that's how, how she sounds like in my head oh boy and he landed it we never even had a discussion arc athena, <laughs> hurry up we gotta fight that crab monster <laughs> that's, a, that's in my exact dialogue by the way that was <laughs> well think about it this way i wonder if that's how they came up with dr girlfriend and venture brothers they're like yes. hey what what if i hear this like really butch version of jackie onassis kennedy whenever she talks someone's like oh no that's exactly who i had in mind oh okay so it's just so funny oh my well, gosh well garth ennis did that um I, yes I'm... i was gonna mention that um the garth okay so a perfect example of this where you're like, this is 100%. This this is why you write comics the way you use it. So when Garth Ennis was writing Punisher, he w he did a spinoff series called Barracuda. And Barracuda was a, a nemesis of a Punisher. And there's one part where he has to team up with a, cr a, crime, bro a crime boss named Chris. And Chris just happened to look like Christopher Walken. Nice. But the, the way that he did the dialogue now, it's one thing to try and do what Mark says, where it's like, okay, just make sure the dialogue matches the way that Christopher Walken would talk. The way Garth Ennis wrote it was he actually separated and parsed all the sentences into their own separate speech bubbles. Yes. So in bubble one, it would be like, Barracuda, my friend. And then in the next <laughs> speech bubble, it's like, it is so nice. And in the third bubble, to meet you, finally. <laughs> and when you read it, you can visually see where the parsing takes place. And I thought, this is next level writing where he took that idea, but he took it to the next logical step where you can visually see how how it breaks down. And it's like, this is not just an homage to Christopher Walken. This is Christopher you Walken. You can't help talking. but read it in Christopher Walken's voice. It's impossible <laughs> not to read it because it's parsed and separated in the bubble, so you have no choice but to read it as Christopher Walken. It's so well done. It's why Garth Ennis is one of our favorite writers. <laughs> so it's I'm I'm glad to hear you say that because there's actually um I had a I don't even know what you would call it because it's not a poem, it's not a short story, it's a one page like story, right? 
and the whole topic is dealing with depression but the way that it's laid out on the page is so intentional where there will be huge gaps and then like a word that's over here and then there'll be gaps again and then a word that's over here and it's like the the point is it's supposed to feel almost um cumbersome to read because yeah. of the content that's being said in there and so i love that you guys are like yeah this is this is awesome having you know everything kind of parsed down like that where it forces you to take those breaks and i, I think it's something that I, I really wish that people did more in in comics and in more visual mediums because i feel like it's really really effective there's a piece of writing that's i'm glad that you mentioned that too there's a piece of writing advice that we're starting to implement with volume six and it's a trick that we learned from manga which is part of what gives the enjoyment of any piece of work that's in the visual storytelling medium is time dilation. You have to give the sense of either time taking place really quickly or the idea of an accordion effect where time is outstretched. And the way you do that is you can put inset panels where there's nothing happening. There's no dialogue or anything like that. It's one thing to use like an ellipses where a character is thinking or there's just you know a pause between... Uh, talking but there's also something to be said when you just have a panel where it's two characters kind of standing off but there's no dialogue at all it's yeah. this idea that yes it almost seems like a superfluous panel but without it in there everything is coming along at a much faster quicker pace right. as opposed to the having pause. it there you need, the, you need the the physical break from everything yes. in order to slow down the reader and if you're a reader like me because i come more from a, a film you know uh, video editing kind of background for the most part I see things play out as you know videos or as um, like TV series and things like that and that's that's what ends up happening I was like this would be like a slow pan so if I really yes. want to sell a slow pan maybe I do a really really long panel that is a super wide shot of something because you're going to sit on that panel for a second trying to figure out why the hell it's in there <laughs> uh even if all you're like, it's just a silhouette of something, you know, and it's yeah. like, but the point is you had to scan across this whole thing. And if nothing else, it at least gives you that feeling of if it was a camera that was panning across before you finally got to the character. Um, well, it reminds me of like the, the introductory scene to Back to the Future, the first movie. So Back to the Future is an example of where every detail matters from the time the credits appear in the beginning, and it's a very slow pan through Doc um, Brown's laboratory. All those details are important. The name of the dog on the dog bowl, so you know his name is Einstein. The fact that there's like references to lightning hitting the clock tower that's on a, like a newspaper that's on there as well. All of those things are part of it because they're trying to introduce you to a fictional world that's going to matter in that movie because as time changes, those small details will be altered as well. But Take, for example, in manga, um, why is it that you'll have these shots where, let's say on a subway train, you'll have a, a close-up of the handles that you hold onto when you're, running, when you're riding on the subway train. They'll have a close-up of it, and then it'll, shot, it'll, it'll shoot to the subway train itself with all the passengers in it. Well, the reason that they do that is because when you're riding on a subway train and it's something mundane, you're just waiting to get to your next stop, a lot of times you're not doing anything important. You're literally staring at something as mundane as yep. the handle on it. And what that does actually is it can save time for the artist because in the establishing shot of the subway train itself, they can do things like not draw faces onto the humans or yep. fade them into the background. The idea being you just have to know that you're in the subway train and as far as you know, it's just being there you're not having to pay attention to anything important right. and then you have two choices you can do something important in which case you almost shock the reader or you're just having like a conversation with someone on the train where it's like no you just have to understand location wise where they are it doesn't matter what the details are in that environment exactly well this has been such a quick hour uh, yeah, it it's was. insane how fast time goes by when when we have our awesome guests on and we just get into the meat and potatoes and stuff. Um, before we wrap up our good friend, Mr. Gibby over there has, uh, has some scenarios to throw you two in. So <laughs> give, take it away. All right. Who, who would like to go first? Mark, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> All right. Oh, wow. <laughs> just 
throw him under the bus. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Mark, it's the dead of night, and you hear a scream outside your house. You wake up, and you go to your bedroom window, and you look outside, and there's a, there's a naked person, and they're bleeding. And they're crying out for help. You run downstairs and come to their aid. You see, you see what you can do, but the, reach, the person reaches out to you, touches you on the arm, and says, I'm sorry, but it's your turn. The person vanishes, but all their wounds transfer onto you. You look behind you, and here comes a pack of hellhounds pulling a demonic chariot, and a great demon is coming for you. Jeez. You have one weapon of choice, three books, and one luxury item. What do you do? I guess I tell the demon, I'm sorry, it's your turn, and I transfer all my wounds onto him, and then everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> well then, fuck my scenario, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming that the, the wounds are, are transitory to whoever you touch, it's like the curse from the ring. But if it doesn't work out that way, then I guess I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's got to be the quickest answer. <laughs> I love any, it. any books, Mark? You take that has books? to be the most avoidant answer we've <laughs> heard so far. <laughs> well, um, no, now, I mean, if no, I had a book it. with me, so oh, so my weapon is a, is a book to uh, to ward off the demon and, and his chariot of hellhounds. <laughs> so, what book would I be using to to ward them off? I don't know. I, I tell the demon that he can he can take me to hell, but only after I finished reading uh, The Stand by Stephen King. So I just <laughs> that'll buy me some time. <laughs> Be like, I, I know how to ward him off. I'll just start reading Tom King's work. <laughs> oh God, yeah, reading it out loud like, oh, <laughs> like, that, oh that's that's too much. <laughs> oh, that that that'll burn a demon worse than the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer, holy hell. Uh, all right, Gabe, you want to you wanna throw Tim under the bus now? All right, you ready, Tim? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a rainy day. You're just relaxing your couch, not doing much. There's a knock at the door. Uh, all right, you get up, you open the door. No one's there. Shrugging, you close it, go back to your couch. But then you notice wet footprints on the ground, walking into the house. The lights go off. Ooh. Everything's pitch black. You hear laughter. Books are sh- shaking. Bookshelves are turning over. Picture frames are moving. And then the laughter gets a little deeper and says, welcome. You have one weapon of choice, three books, and one luxury item. What do you do? I just leave the house and call a priest. <laughs> His luxury item is a priest. Yeah. <laughs> that- Wait, you need, a, you need a young priest and an old priest, because that's what you need for an exorcism, right? <laughs> so, so the weapon is the old priest, the luxury item is the young priest. That's right, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the young priest is the Cadillac version of, of exorcists who would come in in that... In that scenario. Yeah, you need the pri- you need the one priest that'll say like, "No, take me," and then jump out a window. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless it's a comedy, if it was just a young priest, like, "Fuck that, nope, I'm done. <laughs> Pull this collar off, and I'm out." <laughs> it's fun. It's funny that you bring up that scenario because uh, this is a real life thing that actually happened. Oh, but um, in Unsolved Mysteries, back in the '80s, there was an episode on the Queen Mary, and one of the reenactions that they did was they reenacted what people claim has happened over the years, which is the Olympic class swimming pool. There's supposedly a ghost that haunts it of a young girl. And specifically, they would see footprints, like wet footprints coming out of the pool. And I was on the Queen Mary about seven years ago, and I visited that pool, and it is scary <laughs> as heck. Nope. So in a way, I've been anticipating this, because my, my answer is the same. <laughs> it's like the, the, the answer is don't be in that area to begin with. <laughs> like, why in the world am I there? Oh, yeah, That's... it's because it was a complimentary ticket to go on a tour of the ship with a, with a hotel stay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Great answers. Both rather efficiently avoiding, but very good. Very good. <laughs> Uh, we want to thank everybody who's been watching. We appreciate every last one of you. I, of course, want to thank the panel. You guys are always epic. And our guests, you guys were phenomenal. Thank you so much to Tim and Mark for coming and hanging out with us. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to Red Valkyrie. Maybe become a member. Maybe go check out our merch store. You never know. There's all kinds of good stuff going on there. And uh, we will see you guys next week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.
Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of Writing Pros. If you enjoyed our content, then you know the drill. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you want to support us in other ways, then you can always become a channel member or shop our merch store. Red Valkyrie is currently accepting anonymous, fan-submitted stories for their on-air review later in the season. So if you want some feedback, send your submissions to redvalkyrie.writingpros at gmail.com. We'll see you next time.